All right, so uh, I'm Keith Lockich, and uh, we are live at the Ayn Rand Institute headquarters in Santa Ana, California. Uh, so you can see our, our sweet thing right over there. And the reason we're going live tonight is because we are, we are celebrating Ayn Rand's birthday. So this Saturday, February 2nd, uh, is, uh, would have been Ayn Rand's 114th birthday. And we're having a party tonight at our offices. Um, so we're having a little celebration. We're doing a little pre-thing on Facebook to, to see if we can get people interested. Uh, we're having a little feed that's going right now, and then we're gonna we're gonna go in and look at the offices a little bit, and then we're going to stop this feed and switch to the feed where the celebration is going. So let's go into the office, and we'll say a little bit about this. So. So this is the world headquarters of the Ayn Rand Institute. This is where we work all our magic, where we write our articles and send out the free books and grade the essay contests, all that sort of thing. Uh, we're having an event here tonight. People are coming in off the elevators. It's kind of exciting. You can There's a big crowd back in our little crowd room back there. So I thought I would say a little bit about our headquarters here. Uh, let's come over here. So this is our... Uh, this is our blue-green wall. Blue-green was um, Ayn Rand's favorite color, so we have this beautiful wall, and we have our logo done nicely over here. This is our entrance lobby. Um, we have this beautiful sculpture by Sandra Shaw. It's a, it's a bust of Ayn Rand, which she was donated to the Institute. Um, so we get to enjoy this beautiful sculpture when we come to work every day. One of the things that's really nice about our offices here is we have some exhibit space. We have sort of an exhibit gallery. <clears throat> and we have some exhibits that are currently up that are celebrating certain milestones. So last year, 2018, was the 75th anniversary of The Fountainhead, the publication of The Fountainhead, published in 1943. And this year actually is the 50th anniversary of Ayn Rand's book, The Romantic Manifesto, which has a lot of her, her theory of art. So we have this exhibit wall here celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Romantic Manifesto. This is sort of a stylized version of the cover of the, of the, uh, of the book. And so this is one of the things we can do in our offices, have these exhibits. So for the 50th anniversary of the Fountainhead last year, um, our summer conference was actually held in Southern California. And we took the opportunity to create a whole exhibit about Ayn Rand's vision for the Fountainhead, what she was hoping to do in writing the novel, and then what it took to write the novel and get it published, and then what the impact of the novel was. So the exhibit actually, you can see the title page of the exhibit up here, and it actually extends around the entire office. We're not going to do the whole tour right now, but you know, if you, come, if you come visit Southern California and you're interested, we love to have visitors here. Just you know, let us know in advance. and, and we can arrange a tour. You can come and get a tour and actually see the exhibit, come visit the offices, come experience what it's like here. One thing we will show you is we have Ayn Rand's writing desk here. So this is the desk on which she wrote all of her novels, including Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged. Um, so this is sort of the crown jewel of our collection here. It's, it's the actual writing desk on which she worked her magic. So, so let's see, how are we doing for time here? So we're going to make our way towards the celebration. The celebration is going to start in about five minutes. So we're going to make our way through there. And, and if we can, we're going to try to make our way through the crowd. And we're going to go back into the Ayn Rand archives. So this is something else that's special about our office here. We actually have, um, we have the archives that houses all of Ayn Rand's papers. We have a huge collection of, of just sort of really valuable materials that document Ayn Rand's life and her work. So. Let's walk this way. We're going to see the crowd that's gathering for Ayn Rand's birthday celebration. Okay, so uh, here we are. Every everyone's quieting down. They're taking their seats. Um, they've all uh, got their champagne because we're going to have a little toast for Ayn Rand's birthday. We're going to kind of make our way back through the crowd. Here. <laughs> I'm going to grab one of these too. Yeah, sure. Actually, you know what? I'll get it on my way out. We are live on Facebook coming through here. Oh, exciting. 
So back here, this is the Ayn Rand archives. And we come back into this room. Um, so we have a facility here that houses, it's a, it's a, a climate controlled storage facility where we house all the actual documents. But in this room, we have, we have some collections here. We have some books, you know, we have a whole collection of Ayn Rand's books. And the one thing I did want to point out here, because we're not going to be able to see this later, is we have this beautiful, uh, these, these little stuffed lion cubs. So these belong to Ayn Rand. They're called, their names are Oscar and Oswald. And they were just, they were just a little, a little knick-knack that she loved. And she used to bring them out at Christmas. And she and her husband used to give Christmas gifts to each other, signed, this one's from Oscar, this one's from Oswald. So it's just, it's, 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 it's one of her values, one of the things that she loved. And, um, you know, because they're, they're, they're kind of old, we don't really bring them out um, too often because we have to preserve them as part of what the archives does. But we wanted to take this opportunity to show them off to you guys on Facebook. Stay tuned for the next feed, and you can watch the Ayn Rand birthday celebration. So welcome, everyone. For you who don't know who I am, I'm Tal Safani, the president and CEO of the Ayn Rand Institute. Welcome, everyone, on Facebook, and welcome, everyone, here. Thank you for making it in this rainy day in California. Um, and I'm sorry for my voice. I'm recovering from a cold, so have to excuse me. And for you who don't know what this background is, uh, those are Capuletti's. Um, uh, courtesy of Jim Brown. Uh, this is a painter that Ayn Rand loved and had a relationship with, and uh, this is the beautiful background we're going to use for today. I usually don't read from paper, but I'm going to read from paper today because uh, I want to be very precise in what I say. Um, so I really want to welcome everyone to the Institute and for the celebration of uh, Rand's 114th birthday. And um, I want to say that, <clears throat> you know, we know when she was born exactly. She, she was born in February 2nd, 1905. But we don't know exactly where another, uh, when another towering figure in philosophy was born, Aristotle. We know he was born in uh, 384 BC, uh, but we don't know the exact date. Because if we did, I'm sure we will be celebrating uh, his birthday as well today in 2019, 24th centuries later. Um, the reason to celebrate the birthday of this man, who was born 24 centuries ago, is because of his timeless, pioneering contributions to philosophy and human flourishing. The reason why I bring up Aristotle is that I'm completely, utterly confident that the world will be celebrating Ayn Rand's birthday 24 centuries from now, exactly for the same reason, because of her timeless, unprecedented, and unique contributions to philosophy and literature, and for completing the foundation that Aristotle laid down back in ancient Greece. It makes me smile to just think that in the year of 4,305, people will be celebrating Rand's 2,400th birthday. It's hard to imagine what the world would look like uh, then, but it is clear to me that it will be still, still be heavily impacted by Ms. Rand's discoveries, innovation, uh, or innovative solutions new formulations and philosophical and solutions to philosophical problems that men have struggled with through the ages. That's the time scale on which philosophy works. A seminal philosopher like Aristotle went entire centuries where his work were buried, forgotten, and still more centuries when his work was distorted, misunderstood, and badly interpreted. Until Ayn Rand came along and reclaimed the mantle of Aristotle for the cause of reason, individualism, and self-interest. As all of you know, we're working hard, in the, hard here in the Institute to keep her ideas from being forgotten, misunderstood, distorted, and badly interpreted. Speaking of ARI, February 2nd also marks the 34th birthday of Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, uh, ARI was founded on Rand's 80th birthday back in 18, sorry, 1985, and has grown significantly in size and influence uh, ever since. Our charter is to keep this genius's, genius's flame burning, to preserve her legacy and promote her life-changing philosophy of objectivism, to be a center of gravity for people seeking truth, clarity, and meaning, a beacon illuminating the path to a free society 
that protects people's ability to pursue their own lives and their own happiness. In the words of George Washington, let us raise a standard to which the wise and honest can repair. Lastly, Ms. Rand didn't just leave us with a clear epistemological and ethical guidance. She left us with a concept of a sense of life, which clarifies how we can enjoy life to the fullest through romantic love and art, also with a manifesto for an aesthetic renaissance. This is why, and I don't know if you know, all of you have read this book, and you ha if you haven't, you should. It changed my life. One of many, right? Um, and we're excited to mark the uh, 50th anniversary this year for the publication of Romantic Manifesto. And it's going to be the theme of this year's uh, Objectivist Conference that we're holding in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I hope you can make it there. It's going to be a beautiful conference. Let me end with a short paragraph of Rand's intro to this book that makes me jump out of bed every morning. Will we see a romantic, uh, an aesthetic renaissance in our time? I do not know. What I do know is this. Anyone who fights for the future lives it today. So let's raise a toast to all of you here and hopefully at home. If you have a glass, go run, put some wine in it. And uh, let's raise a toast to the woman whose ideas, words, and actions light our way into the future. Cheers. 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 So, okay, so now to the program. I want to introduce Keith Lockage. He's our VP content. He's also a PhD in physics and all that. Um, and uh, he's going to talk a little bit about the importance of values in the context of Ayn Rand's birthday. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Tal. Um, so I was given the honor and the opportunity to give some remarks tonight in uh, celebration of Ayn Rand's birthday. And the first thing that occurred to me was to ask myself, what do we actually know about Ayn Rand's view of birthdays? You know, how did Ayn Rand celebrate her birthday? You know, did she, did she have a strong, developed view on birthdays? So I combed the literature to see if I could find out anything about this. I asked uh, Jennifer Woodson if there's anything in the Ayn Rand archives about this. I communicated with Shoshana Milgram, who's writing Ayn Rand's biography. I even talked to Harry Binswanger to see if he had any stories he could tell me. And curiously, it turns out that there's actually not that much information at all about Ayn Rand's perspective on birthdays. It doesn't seem like it was an occasion that was super important to her. You know, by contrast, there's all kinds of stories about Ayn Rand's uh, celebrating New Year's Eve, okay? She definitely viewed New Year's Eve, New Year's Day as a, as a significant occasion, but there's just not that much information that I was able to find about Ayn Rand's view of birthdays. Now, Shoshana did point out to me that there, it, there's one story in all of Ayn Rand's fiction, where the setting is somebody's birthday party, birthday celebration. And that's Ayn Rand's play, The Murder Mystery, Think Twice. But I don't think that we can assume that what we get from Think Twice is Ayn Rand's perspective on birthdays. The only character who talks about birthdays is the character who's celebrating his own birthday, and he's one of the villains of the play. He's sort of a proto Ellsworth Toohey. And all he actually does when he talks about birthdays is he complains about them. He literally says, why do they celebrate birthdays? It's just one year closer to the grave. And then, you know, as if to drive the point home about being closer to the grave, he's the guy that gets murdered in the very next scene. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think that this is an expression of Ayn Rand's perspective on birthdays. So in the end, I, I think we don't actually know that much at all about Ayn Rand's view of birthdays. But what we do know a lot about, and this is really what I wanted to talk about, <clears throat> is we know a lot about Ayn Rand's view of values. And if you think about your birthday as a time to reflect on your life, 
to think about the things that are important to you, to think about the things in your life that you value. Well, objectivism has a lot to say about values. You know, Ayn Rand's writings are dominated from start to finish with one overriding concern, and that is the role of values in a person's life. And, and the life or death difference between people whose lives are centered around the pursuit of rational values versus those who aren't. From a certain point of view, you know, the essence of the moral advice that objectivism has to offer is go out and pursue values. You know, Ayn Rand held that the pursuit of his own happiness is a man's highest moral purpose. But what does it mean to pursue happiness? You know, what does that actually mean in practice? What it actually means in practice is filling your life with values. It means defining, selecting, pursuing, and achieving values in all the important areas of life. You know, that's what it means to pursue happiness. It means finding and pursuing a career that involves you know, deeply fulfilling productive work, not just a job that pays the bills, right? It means building deep connections with people you love, not just passing time with accidental fellow travelers. It means, you know, figuring out all of your favorites in every area of life and going after them, filling your life with material and spiritual values. So to me, that's what's significant about a birthday. It's, a, it's an occasion for celebrating a person's life, but partly what that means is, is focusing on and cherishing and celebrating that person's values. So on that note, I want to end by reading a quote from Leonard Peikoff. So this is from his talk, My 30 Years with Ayn Rand. I thought it was a perfect quote to use for tonight on the occasion of Ayn Rand's birthday because it's a, it's a beautiful description of some of Ayn Rand's most important values, but also it's a beautiful description of Ayn Rand as a valuer. So let me read you this quote from Dr. Peacock. He says, Ayn Rand, quote, held intense values in every department of life. She loved her husband of 50 years, Frank O'Connor, a sensitive, intense man, not nearly as intellectual as she, but just as independent and deep in his own quiet way. As to Ayn Rand's other values, I have hardly room here even to mention a sample. Some of them are obvious from her writings, such as America, skyscrapers, modern technology, man the hero, the great romantic artists of the 19th century, the silent German movies from her childhood that she always tried to find again, Agatha Christie, TV's Perry Mason, and there were so many more, from her cats to her lion pictures to her Adrian clothes to her vivid outsized jewelry to her stamp collecting to her favorite candy, Godiva chocolates, and even her favorite color, blue-green. Continuing the quote, in every aspect of life, she told me, a man should have favorites. He should define what he likes most and why, and then proceed to get it. And she always did just that, from fleeing the Soviet dictatorship for America to tripping her future husband on a movie set to get him to notice her, to ransacking ancient record shops to unearth some lost treasure, to decorating her apartment with an abundance of blue-green pillows, ashtrays, and even walls. Ayn Rand was a woman dominated by values, values that were consistent expressions of a single view of life, which is what you might expect of a great thinker who was at once a moralist and an artist, unquote. So let me end by proposing another toast. I want to make another toast to Ayn Rand for teaching us all what it means and what it looks like to live a life dominated by values. Happy birthday, Ayn Rand. Okay, now we're going to watch an amazing technological uh, 
experience here. We're going to move uh, live stream from this feed to, uh, to uh, Zoom, and we're going to conference in uh, uh, Dr. Harry Binswanger, who is a, an ARI board member and who was an associate of Ayn Rand herself. And he's going to talk about some recollections of Ayn Rand as a valuer. So uh, let's move to Harry. Hopefully you all can hear and see here. Harry. OK, so let me try to make it as big as possible so everybody can see you. And you go. Take it. I want to talk about the extent to which Ayn Rand, as she herself put it, wanted to look up. Sometimes you hear only about Ayn Rand in her anger at things that were irrational and evil. But I want to talk about her admiration for things that were good and the lengths that she would go to to find something that was good. I'll start with a small incident that happened at a lecture. She was at a lecture that Leonard Peikoff was giving, and they, they both took part in the Q&A afterwards. Someone uh, asked a question that began with, "My, it's impossible for my husband to evade. And I thought, oh my god, here she is denying free will, denying the essence of everything that underlies objectivism. And Ayn Rand said something to Leonard Peikoff, who was at the microphone. And I thought, boy, she's going to get it now, the person who asked the question. And Dr. Peikoff said, Ms. Rand says, I'd like to meet him. So she was not focused on the implication for den denial of free will, if there was that implication. But on here was a man who never evaded. And that was what she treasured. That was her top value, the use of the mind uh, by each individual. The uh, second such example, again, clouding the philosophical problems, was a man named Reverend Ike. Reverend Ike was a preacher who preached the gospel of success. He told his church uh, people, Go out and make money. God wants you to succeed. It's good to make money, to enrich yourself. You are responsible for yourself. God gave you the ability to produce. Go out and produce. She thought that was wonderful, and she praised him in, I believe it was the Ayn Rand letter, saying it was a very good sign, whereas I thought, the man's a reverend. This is mysticism. This is evil. She didn't have that attitude. She wanted to look up. Another occasion, um, I heard her praise Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali was someone I don't admire because he was a, a black Muslim. He joined the, uh, in effect, the forces of Islamic Jihad, which we didn't know about then under that name. But you remember, he said, I am the greatest. And he was the greatest. So she thought this was wonderful. And she even considered, I mean, I don't know how seriously, but she even considered trying to cast him in the role of one of her heroes if Atlas Shrugged was filmed as a miniseries. Then her last speech was in New Orleans. It was called The Sanction of the Victims. And the man who brought her there was James U. Blanchard, who founded something called the National Committee for Monetary Reform. They were a bunch of what is now called gold bugs. They would have conventions every year and more and more people started going because this was the late 70s and the uh, hyperinflation and gold was having its day. So he invited her to come down and as an inducement, he said, I'll send a private rail car. 
you'll be able to have your private car on the back of a train and ride on the train overnight from the New York to New Orleans, and I'll pay you in gold. Well, she couldn't turn that down. <laughs> so she went down, and I had the pleasure and the honor of riding in that car along with uh, Dr. Peacock um, to uh, New Orleans with her. And uh, we got there, and she was introduced to Jim Blanchard. Jim Blanchard was in a wheelchair. Jim Blanchard had been crippled in a, I believe, a motorcycle accident at the age of 18. And he told her, I was listening to him tell the story to her next to her. He said, I was in a wheelchair then, and I was 18, and I thought my life was over. I was really depressed. I didn't want to do anything ever again. I didn't know if I wanted to live. And someone gave me a copy of Anthem. And I read Anthem, and it just changed me entirely. I became dedicated to making of my life what I could. I'm not giving the verbatim transcript of the conversation, but that's what it essentially was. And I got married. I made a business. I made a success. My firstborn son, I have named Anthem. And she said... You're the kind of hero I write about. And she wanted to believe that. I don't think he actually quite was, but uh, she was very impressed, and she loved to find this kind of positive uh, inspiration. One place where she got it, and it was authentic, of course, was her husband, Frank O'Connor, who was the kind of hero that she wrote about as you probably have noticed both Frank Kahn and Francisco D'Anconia are variations of Frank O'Connor. Francisco D'Anconia, Frank O'Connor. Coincidence? I don't think so. She never admitted to that, but it's, it's pretty clear to me that, that uh, she admired him tremendously Whenever they were together, she wanted to hold his hand. She called him Cubby Hole, or Cubby for short, and he called her Kitten Fluff. They were uh, in love to the end, and um, I remember after, she, after he had died, when I started working with her on the Objectivist Forum, my publication of the time, uh, she said at one point, I'll... I couldn't have done what I did without Frank. I'll write you an article entitled My Debt to Frank O'Connor. So about six months or a year later, I said to her, you know, you promised to write for my publication an article, My Debt to Frank O'Connor. And you, you haven't done that. What about your promise? And she said, well, if you really want to torture me, you can hold me to it. <laughs> That's why it never appeared. I, I, I wasn't going to do that. But it was after he died, her motor was cut because he was her proof on earth that the kind of hero that she wrote about was not something that you needed to make up in fiction, but he actually existed. And I think you can see behind me two of his paintings. Uh, both of them are unfinished, but I, the one of the um, still life over here is my favorite painting. It's got a fantastic uh, sense of life. It was an assignment, by the way, by the other painter that she loved, Capoletti, Jose Manuel Capoletti. Uh, Keith Lockridge was standing in front of paintings by Capoletti uh, when he ended his tour of the Institute. Uh, so the composition was kind of dictated by Capoletti, and there were to be two books, as you see, and Capoletti said, yes, one of them can be Atlas Shrugged. And you see Atlas Shrugged there. But the, the sense of life, the modernity 
the cleanliness, the essentialization, the benevolence is just so eloquent in that painting. And the other one on the left is in a more, even more primitive state, even of the one on the right, it's not finished. That was a uh, study of um, a, a friend who was a model. And uh, it's so, you can't see her face, but you, you get the feeling that she's grieving, that she's crying, that she's sad. And yet the light on her is so bright that you know it's not a sad pain that she's going to recover. Uh, I love that one too. So um, the, the issue with Frank was that he gave her the inspiration that she needed to fuel her. She needed a man to look up to. She wasn't just a valuer. She was a man worshiper. When Frank died, she didn't have that. Another story is how she found a temporary seeming replacement when she formed a crush on an actor. That maybe has to be developed at another time, but his name was Hans Gudegast. And when she discovered him by watching a certain series on TV, she said it was like the sun came out again. He was very important in her last final years, although she never met him. And she said he was as nothing compared to Frank. <laughs> so she, uh, she was not only a valuer, she wanted to look up. She was an admirer and she would find things to admire wherever she could. That was desperately important to her. Thank you very much. Okay, so hopefully we're back here. Um, thank you, Harry. Always nice to hear more uh, biographical anecdotes about Ayn Rand. Uh, I want to introduce Jennifer Woodson. She heads our uh, archives department, and she's going to talk a little bit about things you can see around you. Sorry, people on the web, you can't, but uh, you're welcome to visit. Um, so take it away. As Keith already mentioned, uh, we know that Ayn Rand didn't put a particular emphasis on celebrating her birthday. One ritual she and Frank did have, though, was to bring out and display two stuffed lion cubs, Oscar and Oswald, on special occasions. And when they exchanged gifts, uh, Oscar and Oswald were often referenced. Uh, since we know they came out for birthdays and Christmas, we've brought them out today. And they are on a table in the Ayn Rand Archives reading room, so you can go visit them. I also wanted to show you two other things that we have on display. The first is Ayn's uh, 1972 birthday card for Frank, which upholds the lion theme. Uh, she changed a card meant for a seven-year-old into a card for a 75-year-old, um, probably because she really liked the lion cub that's on the front. And inside, the message says it's from Fluff, which is an abbreviation of Kitten Fluff. And she says it's also from Oscar and Oswald, too. So you can go see that back in there. And then this second card is an undated birthday sketch from Frank to Ein, but it reads as if it's from Oswald. So both of these items will be on display. You can come see them for the next hour. And we'll also be offering a tour of our storage for anyone who's interested for the next hour. So thank you. So as Jennifer was saying, it's a unique opportunity. You're welcome to tour inside uh, the archives and see what we have there. Um, ask her about what's, what's, uh, uh, what we have digitized and what not. We're really uh, trying to raise more money to digitize more things in the archive and uh, make it safer and uh, long lasting. So um, I just want to finish by uh, thanking each and every one of you for coming and sharing this uh, celebration with us. It's a, very emotional to a lot of us. 
and uh, thank, thank you for sharing um, you know, the values that we hold so dear. Uh, I just want to say a couple of words about the fact that the Ayn Rand Institute is to continu continuing to grow and, and to thrive. We have a lot of programs. If you want to learn more about the programs and what we're doing and how you can help us, reach out to one of us uh, right here. We'll tell you a little bit more. Thank you, everyone.